Good evening, everybody. This is Brian Minsker. I'm the Legislative Advocacy Director for the Illinois PTA, and this is our Fall Advocacy Campaign Briefing Webinar. Uh, we want to start out with PTA's mission, which is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. Because when we come to PTA, we are at our root an advocacy organization. Uh, many of the things we take for granted in, in life these days, such as child labor laws, juvenile justice system, the public health system, kindergarten, childhood immunizations, school lunch and breakfast program, or even something as simple as school bus swing arms have all come about as a part of PTA advocacy. Now, you may not think you're an advocate, um, you're not really there, but if you have spoken to a teacher about a classroom issue, or you've spoken to a principal about a school issue, or a superintendent about a school board or the school board about a district policy, you have been an advocate. At its most simple point, what advocacy is, is talking and working to make the situation better. And the keys to that are talking to the person who can change the situation, share what the problem is, and ask them to fix it possibly with a solution you provide. Just like if you are dealing with uh, your child being bullied in classroom, the person sitting in the desk behind them is poking them during class. Uh, you wanna talk to the child's teacher because that's the person who can make the change. You want to tell them exactly what's happening to your child and why it's affecting them. And then you ask them, are there solutions? Can you move the kid to the front of the class so he's not behind my kid and able to poke somebody or um, can you move my kid to a different desk there? So that's basically advocacy in, it, in its ba most basic thing is talking to people and working to make a change. And if you can do it with a teacher, you can do it with a legislator as well, because they are just people as well. So why be a PTA advocate? The reason PTA has been so effective with advocacy over the years is because we know the needs of students and families. We are families with students. We bring PTA credibility to the issues. And in many cases, nobody else may be speaking up for children, especially on the local level with your uh, local PTAs. Uh, I know when Illinois PTA serves on uh, various state boards for the governor or the Illinois State Board of Education, very often PTA is the only one there speaking up for parents and children and families. Uh, everybody else there is representing various constituencies, school administrators, teachers, and such. And Illinois PTA is the only one at the table focused on children and families. When we talk about PTA advocacy, it's important to remember that we are 501c3 organizations. And with that comes some requirements from the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, the main one is that we can discuss issues, not people. That means we can talk about uh, school bond referendums. We can talk about uh, policies regarding how curriculum is screened in the school district, but we don't uh, endorse candidates. We don't talk about people, you know, support people who are running for office, whether it's school board or representative, state representative, congressional representative, president of the United States, none of those. We only talk about issues that we can advocate. We are nonpartisan in that, so that when we have a candidate forum for school board members, we invite everybody, regardless of their party. Excuse me. Uh, and finally, the last IRS requirement is that PTAs can only spend an insignificant part of your budget towards your advocacy efforts. Uh, and the IRS has defined that as 5% of your budget. So if you're supporting a bond referendum, your PTA can spend up to 5% of its budget on signs for people to put in their yard or door hangers to hang on doors throughout the neighborhoods, uh, asking them to support a bond referendum or something like that, but you can't exceed 5%. We're gonna talk a little bit here about how you meet with a legislator. Um, even though our fall advocacy campaign is a virtual one, but it's important because there are a lot of issues that come up locally where you may wanna to talk to a legislator. And the first way you can do this is with Illinois PTA's uh, advocacy tool called Voter Voice. And this is, makes life really easy for you if you wanna get in touch with your legislator. You can find it on the advocacy tab 
uh, menu uh, for the Illinois PTA website at illinoispta.org. And you click on the take action button over on the left side there. And that takes you into voter voice. Over on the right, you'll have several different uh, options there. You can sign up for alerts, but down at the bottom, you can find officials and you can choose either elected officials or candidates who are running for office, which may be something that you wanna check out right now um, uh, with the election coming up in a week. And when you click on your elected officials, it gives you your state officials here. You can also see your federal, but this is the state ones. Uh, and it includes the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, treasurer, and even the comptroller. And then it will also have your state senator and your state representative listed as well. And if you want to send a message to them, you can just check the little box next to their picture there and click compose message and send them an email. Uh, Voter Voice already knows their email address um, and, and can make it very easy for you to do it directly there. If you wanna find out a little bit more about where your representative or your Senator stands on an issue, uh, if you click on their name uh, there, it's a link and it takes you into their profile. And very often you will see their website, uh, their Facebook, their Twitter. Uh, it may have their email address here as well, it may not, um, but there are several different things you can find out about them there as well. Uh, if you go to their Facebook profile, they often have a way to send a message there. And they also list their websites very often on there. On their Twitter, they also have their websites listed as well. And you can also tweet at them. Uh, you know, there are representatives, they wanna be able to be in touch with uh, constituents and, and get messages out. So they are very often on Facebook and Twitter and, and are very responsive to things there. I have found locally when I have an issue uh, with my city, if I also, respond to the city department on Twitter and at my city council member as well, I find things happen a lot quicker than if I just talk to the department or call them up or email the department. And if you go to their website as well, they often have a contact us button as well. And as I said, here's uh, Representative Marin. He also has his email address listed here. The other way of contacting your legislator is through the Illinois General Assembly website, which you can find at ilga.gov. And it is clear when you see the main page of the General Assembly's website that they are not spending your taxpayer dollars on updating it because it still looks like it's from about 1998. Uh, but you can find your member if you know their names. And if you don't know their names, you can use it through voter voice because you type in your address and it will tell you who they are. Um, you can go to the members button for either the Senate or the House, and it gives you the whole list here. And you can see Senator Bennett there pointed out, and you can click on his name. You can also see what committees he serves on and what bills he is co-sponsoring. It will have here a li little bit more information for you. It has his district office. Um, and with senators, uh, because they have two representative districts in their Senate district, uh, they very often have a second office at least, if not a third, depending on how big their district is. Um, and it also lists here on the who their associated representatives in their district are as well. Uh, and again, here's Representative Marin, who there his email is also here. Um, so that's how you find a legislator and, and can get in touch with them. Uh, but maybe you're thinking, I don't know if I do I really make a difference when I contact a legislator? Um, and there are three myths we really want to bust here tonight. The first one is that they aren't interested in hearing the voices of parents when it comes to crafting policies. And, and that's not true. Legislators do want to hear from their constituents. They want to hear from people um, when they, and they want to know how a piece of legislation is going to affect your family or your school or your child. So your voice is very important to speak up to your legislator. The second myth is that meeting with a staff member isn't as important as meeting with your legislator. Maybe you are meeting in a district office and they are in Springfield that day. Uh, their staff member, particularly in the district office, may be more informed than the, the senator or the representative. Uh, so meeting with them can have a, a 
maybe a better discussion with them than you would have with your representative or your senator. Uh, and they will respond with you and work with you, and they will share your meeting with the legislator. The third myth is that my meeting won't mean as much if I only meet with my legislator once. And I, I like to talk about how legislators get contacted as sort of a pyramid. And at the bottom are emails. And, and we do have an email campaign, but if you get a lot of them in there, that makes a difference because they see those. But they get a lot of emails on a lot of different issues. If you call your legislator, they don't get nearly as many phone calls. And your phone call doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be, I want Senator Bennett to support and co-sponsor this bill because of X reason. And the staff person at the district office will mark it down as, as a support for this. Uh, and in many cases, especially with uh, bills that are getting a lot of uh, action from both sides, uh, they may just be tallying how many are coming in on each. And finally, there's people who go and actually meet with their legislators or their staff. And those are even fewer than the phone calls. So that if you are meeting physically with a legislator or their staff person, you are standing out already. So what you have to say really makes a significant difference compared to a phone call or an email. Um, so a meeting can really mean something on a piece of legislation even if it's only the first time you've done it, even if you don't intend to ever meet with them again, um, you can make a significant difference even with just one meeting. When you do meet with a legislator or speak with them on a phone, we'd like to talk about the ABCs of meeting with legislators. Be accurate, be brief, and be courteous. Be accurate, have your information ready, make sure they are facts from knowledgeable sources, uh, if you are using Wikipedia, go down to those cited sources below and, and use those um, as your, your base source to make sure that they got uh, included in the Wikipedia article correctly. Uh, be brief. Uh, legislators are busy, especially if you are meeting with them in person. Uh, they may be, have five minutes, they may have 15 minutes, they may have to run off for a sudden vote. Uh, so you want to be brief and you want to make sure you have your important points that you want to get across at the front of your mind and make sure you load them up front, then fill in with the details of what you want, why you want them to do that action. And then you circle back at the end of your meeting, reminding them of what you'd like them to do. And finally, be courteous. Uh, we've all seen uh, videos of the last few years of people at school board meetings or meeting with legislators or town halls yelling at legislators um, and that doesn't work if you're trying to persuade them to do something that you want them to do and take your solution and use it and run with it you it's you know it's yelling at them your toddler yelled at you when they were three that you didn't get what they wanted when they screamed at you but when they asked you nicely they were much more likely it's the same way with legislators be brief be accurate and always always be courteous When you prepare for a meeting, uh, be aware of their position on your issue. You can find that from their website. You can find it from the bills that they're sponsoring. Uh, if they are not sponsoring, it doesn't mean they are, are not they are against it. It just means they may not have signed on as a co-sponsor. But see if you can find what their position is on the issue. Uh, again, website, what they've tweeted about on the issue or what they've got on their Facebook page can help you find out what that is. Second, know what you are asking for. In many cases, if it's a piece of legislation, you want them to co-sponsor it, not just vote for it. Voting for it is, is fairly passive and the bill may not even get to a vote. Um, so a vote commitment is a very weak commitment. What you want them to do is co-sponsor the bill, put their name on it. Um, and the more co-sponsors that get on a bill, the more likely it is to come to a floor for a vote. So when you are asking them to do something with this particular bill, Ask them to co-sponsor, not just to vote for it. Know what your talking points are that support what you're asking for. And, and when you go through and you have your issue and you have your facts, practice what you're gonna be talking with them. As we said, sometimes you have a very short amount of time. You wanna make sure you have your facts down cold. You ask them what you want them to do right up front. 
you fill it in with why they should do that, and then you circle back around and ask them once again, can I count on your support to co-sponsor this bill or, or support on this issue? When you go to a physical meeting, arrive a few minutes early. Uh, if they have a, are ready a little early, they are happy to take you a few minutes early as well. Uh, introduce yourself when you first meet. Uh, they are very good about doing that as well. Uh, if you can, make a connection. Uh, when I met with Senator Bennett the first time in Springfield, I mentioned that I had met him a uh, year before at a uh, Champaign PTA Council dinner, awards dinner. Uh, and he remembered meeting me from there. So make a little connection if you can. Uh, if, if you don't have a connection, don't worry about it though. Thank them for taking the time with meeting with you and then have your conversation. Make your pitch and your ask. Allow them to ask questions. And when they ask questions, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, but then follow it up with, but I will find out and get back to you or your staffer. And then share your stories. How does this bill personally affect your family or your child or your school? They wanna hear those stories as well. So what do they wanna hear? This is what uh, surveys have shown over the years. 91% want about information about the effect of the bill on their district. Uh, one of the most effective things that Advance Illinois, one of our partners in uh, school funding with evidence-based funding, uh, the past few years has been doing is been creating a sheet for every legislator in the General Assembly, both senators and representatives. And on the back, it has all the school districts that are in their representative district. And it has how well funded they are. Are they at 60% funding? Are they at 70% adequate funding? Are they at 80% or 90 or 100 or 110% even? Um, so, and they are color coded so that they can see very visually and very quickly, especially for those rural districts and downstate that have a lot of red districts that are far from adequate funding. It really drives home the need to support increasing the funding for evidence-based funding because it will mean something for their district. 90% wanna know why you are supporting or opposing a bill or an issue. So have your facts about why they should be taking this position. Um, and then 79% also wanna hear a personal story. It helps them relate to it. If you've ever watched C-SPAN or, or seen clips from you know, uh, legislators on the floor of the House or the Senate in Springfield or in DC, you will sometimes hear, or in committee hearings, they, you will hear them share, I had a constituent who told me this. They want to share those personal stories because stories drive home a message in a way that raw facts cannot. They personalize it. They put a face to it. Um, so if you have a personal story on how a bill will affect or has affect, could affect your family or your child, uh, and one of the things we'll be talking about here is school bus safety, uh, having a story that you can share with them helps drive that home. Wrapping up your meeting, keep track of the time. So making you make sure that you can cover your key talking points. As we said, get your ask up there first, then talk about your facts and then come back at the end to also follow up with your ask and ask for their commitment. Leave behind an issue summary and contact information. This is critical. It, it is something if you have talking points, create a little fact sheet for them on what you want. Have your contact information on it uh, so they can follow up with you if they have a question. Uh, when we have done in-person uh, advocacy days in Springfield, we always leave behind a packet, uh, even if all we talk to is the staffer who sits out at the desk because it has our contact information on it. It has a lot of information there. We will point out specific things sometimes to the staffers and they will write a note on there and, and you know, put a post-it to flag it for the legislator if it's something they think the legislator would really be interested in. So having a little hard copy is a way to remind them about your issue. And then finally, uh, again, as part of being curious, thank them again for taking the time to meet with you. Um, and then after the meeting, you wanna send a follow-up thank you for the email, in an email is just fine. Uh, just a thank you for meeting with me. If they had any questions that you had to answer the, I don't know, but I will get back to you, uh, take that time to share the information. You asked about this. Here is some additional information on that topic. And if you do meet with a legislator, 
at Illinois PTA, we are always happy to hear about that. Uh, you can email us at advocacy at illinoispta.org and it'll get forwarded to us. Uh, we love to share stories. If you've been looking in the weekend update that we send out, we highlight some of the things that PTAs are doing, whether it is uh, you know, Chicago region doing something with a chef this past weekend or PTA who is doing a family engagement thing. If you are doing an advocacy thing in your district, even if it's with your school board, uh, you know, share it with us. We love sharing those stories with other folks across the state. They can inspire folks to do it. All right, before we tar start talking about specific bills, I wanna take a moment here. Does anybody have any questions, uh, any comments? You can unmute yourself and ask them live or you can type them in the chat. Uh, and we'll give you a minute here to do that if you'd like to. All right, not seeing any, we will move on to talking about our fall advocacy campaign. As I mentioned, this is a virtual campaign. Uh, we are not moving a bunch of folks to try and come to Springfield uh, for the veto session. Uh, well, part of that is that the veto session runs Tuesday through Thursdays, and it is sometimes tough, especially uh, around Thanksgiving and Christmas, the holiday times, uh, to get folks to able to come to Springfield in the middle of the week. So a few things to keep in mind about how legislation passes in Springfield. Bills are required to have three readings on three separate days. Um, and this is basically uh, the clerk of, of the House or the Senate reading out the bill number and the title. Um, the second, for the first time, it's just sort of entering it into the register. The second reading is uh, a recommendation from the committee where it can be amended and the third reading is for final passage in that house. Um, there are some shenanigans they can do with various things like shell bills to get through some of these readings without actually having language in it. Um, so that they sometimes pass legislation very quickly. Uh, but in general, things have three readings on three separate days. Uh, and so there is some time spread out there. Uh, many of the bills that we have supported this past year for the General Assembly session in 2022 already passed this spring. Um, there are a few others that we are going to focus on. Um, and most of them have already passed one house so that we are not doing a heavy lift. We're trying to get them through the second house, uh, which makes it a little easier. Our three focus issues are safe gun storage, and there's a bill in both the Senate and the House. Um, and this is based off our resolution on safe gun storage from convention a couple of years ago. We have school safety. We have two uh, bills that we are looking to get uh, passed there. One is on the school zone speed limit change uh, that has already passed the House. And the other one is on school bus safety equipment that has already passed in the Senate. And then finally, there are two juvenile justice bills we are focused on this fall. Um, both of them have already passed in the House, so that we are contacting senators to try and get them uh, to get on board with those. So we're going to go through each one here. Uh, first, starting with safe gun storage, as I said, we had a resolution come uh, to our uh, convention a couple years ago. Uh, it has been submitted to national PTA this year. Uh, and it turns out that Michigan has also submitted a similar uh, resolution on safe gun storage. Uh, so we're working with them to combine that for the national PTA convention this coming year, uh, next year. Uh, and, and some things have changed a little bit since that resolution passed here in Illinois. Uh, the big one is that firearms have become the leading cause of death for children. Uh, they have surpassed accidents. Uh, nationally, over 600 children die by suicide annually. Most often, they're using a family member's gun. And between 70 and 90% of the guns used in school shootings by minors have come from their home or from the home of a relative or a kid or, or a friend. And finally, nearly a quarter of all gun report owners report storing their guns in an unlocked location in the home. So House Bill 552 would require firearm owners to store any firearm in a secure lock containers uh, and has penalties for not doing so. 
Senate Bill 1855 is similar, uh, but it makes it unlawful to keep or store an unsecured firearm in a residence where it is reasonably known that a minor or person ineligible to possess a firearm is likely to gain access without permission. So the difference is that the House bill requires everybody with a firearm to secure it. Senate bill is only if there are minors or a person who is not supposed to have access to firearms um, is likely to do so if it is not secured. So that's a, a slight difference there. Uh, but our reasoning is that getting one of these through uh, either way is an improvement over what the situation is right now. One of our successes this spring was getting the Illinois uh, bill passed uh, that will have the Illinois Department of Public Health doing a safe gun storage education campaign for two years uh, that will include handouts of safe uh, gun storage, uh, trigger locks and uh, gun safes as well. Uh, so that there is some stuff we have accomplished on this already this year, but we would like to actually have guns physically secured. So our ask for our representatives is to co-sponsor the House bill and move it out of its rules committee and bring it to the floor to a vote. For the senators is to co-sponsor the House bill or the Senate bill and move it out of assignments and get it to the floor to a vote. Um, or if they are not doing that with the bill that they have, if House bill is the one that moves, uh, have the senators uh, sign on and co-sponsor that after it passes the House or vice versa with the House members if the Senate bill is the one that moves. Uh, we have been working on this bill for a couple of years now. This is our second year with it. Uh, and we are hopeful, though, because these uh, legislatures uh, adjourned in April, early April this year. Uh, and what we are hearing now is that there is some motivation and incentive among legislators to do something regarding firearms, uh, because the Highland Park Fourth of July parade shooting has happened since they've adjourned uh, the Uvalde school shooting, the school shooting just a couple of weeks ago in St. Louis, uh, in a school there, uh, the shooting in Chicago this weekend. Uh, in, in all those cases, there's a lot more uh, stuff happening here that makes us believe that safe gun storage may actually start moving here in the veto session. So that we are asking them to get that going. Talking points, suicide rates among children and teens who live in homes with guns are four times higher than among those homes without guns. And, and that is just, as we said, 600 children a year commit suicide with firearms, most often with a gun they find in their house. Um, and as you look at the last bullet point as well, only 10% of gun owning adults with children are aware of that increase in risk that it is four times higher. And finally, the suicide risk in homes with guns can be cut in half by doing any one of these three things. If you store your firearm in a locked storage, if you store it unloaded, or if you store the ammunition separate from the firearm, in all three of those, doing any one of those things, you will cut the risk of suicide in half. If you have legislators who talk about this and say, well, they're not for gun control, this is not a gun control issue. This is not about whether you can have a gun or not. It is making sure it is stored safely so that those who should not have it, whether it is a child or a person who should, has had their firearms or access to firearms taken away by a court, cannot get a hold of that. So it is a safety issue, not a gun, uh, a Second Amendment issue. Are there any questions on safe gun storage? We'll give you a minute here to ask or type it in the chat if you do. Seeing none, we will move on to our school safety issues. Uh, the first one is the school zone speed limit. And this one should be a very easy lift. It's already passed the house. So we're only asking senators to support it. Uh, and it is a fairly common sense one. It does two things. One, it eliminates the school zone speed limit. Uh, if you drive past your school, you notice that phrase on there, it has hours or when school children are present. Uh, this bill will strike that because it, when children are present is kind of confusing. 
uh, for a driver to parse? Is it when the children are on the playground, but behind a six foot chain link fence, does that still count as them present? Is it when they are only outside the fence walking home from school? Uh, this clears that up. It is the school zone speed limit is at the designated hours and it expands those hours uh, from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., which is what it currently is, to 5 p.m. And this is a good thing as well, uh, because we have more extracurricular activities that go beyond 4 p.m. Uh, for children and after school programs. Uh, parents generally tend to pick up after work around five o'clock. So having them run at least until 5 p.m. is a, a plus because you have more children moving around during those hours. Uh, so what we are asking of senators is, of course, co-sponsor this bill. And it, it really shouldn't be a controversial thing for them. Uh, they should be able to co-sponsor it and sign on happily and ask them to support passage for it as well. As we said, uh, here's your talking points that you want to talk about with it. Uh, nationally, about 25,000 children are injured every year and 100 are killed in school zone accidents in the US. Even at 20 miles an hour, when you're driving your car at 20 miles an hour in a speed zone or a school zone, you need at least 23 feet for your car to come to a complete stop. By eliminating the when children are present, uh, phrase. It eliminates the ambiguity on when the school zone speed limit is in effect. It is in effect during the hours that it is and extended more accurately reflects when children are present at school. Our second school safety issue is on school bus safety equipment. And this is kind of a weird bill. Uh, in a sense, it's already passed the Senate. Um, but what it does will allow school buses to test an extended school bus stop arm that would block the adjacent lane of traffic. These have been uh, done on the side. Instead of just a stop sign swinging out, a little swing arm with the stop sign on it will swing out and block the adjacent lane of traffic. So on a two lane road, it will completely block the road um, visually for drivers. On a four lane road, it will block the second lane adjacent to the school bus there. Uh, those are the lanes that are required to stop for a school bus on both two lane and four lane roads. And so that, again, should be a no brainer for our House representatives to support. Um, the reason this bill is here uh, changing the oversight load requirements is that when the bill was originally introduced, the state uh, troopers, uh, State Highway Patrol and, and Department of Transportation's concern was that with an extended stop arm, a school bus could maybe be considered an oversized load. And when you have an oversized load, there's a whole bunch of legal requirements that you have to have. You have to have the oversized load sign on the back, like you see when, uh, if you see them transporting a wind turbine uh, vane or a big piece of equipment, a big bulldozer or a big tank of some sort, you know, you've got the oversized load sign on the truck that's actually hauling the thing. You sometimes have to have a pickup truck in front with flashing lights, a pickup truck behind with flashing lights, uh, also advertising the oversized load. And it doesn't make sense for school buses to have that. So the recommendation was that they exempt school buses from the oversized load uh, while they are testing this to see if it reduces accidents and problems. So it's kind of a technical thing, but again, it's not a difficult ask for our representatives to pass. And what we're asking is for our representatives to co-sponsor Senate Bill 1808 and support passage of it. Talking points here, uh, the Illinois State Board of Education has noted that getting on or off the school bus is the most dangerous part of the trip for children who ride a school bus to school or home or back to home from school. Uh, when they are on the school bus, they are generally pretty safe because most things that hit a school bus are not enough to really move the students around that much on a school bus. So they are generally pretty safe even without seat belts on a school bus. It's getting on or off when they have the problems. I couldn't find a hard number more recently than 1996, uh, but I did find anecdotal articles talking about school bus drivers talking about more people seeming to pass school buses while the stop arm is allowed is extended 
Uh, but back in 1996, the Illinois Department of Transportation estimated there were 1.9 million stop arm violations in one year. That, that's one stop arm violation for every student in Illinois, uh, uh, which was just a stunning number when I saw it. I, it's, it's huge. Um, and in Illinois, according to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, between 2009 and 2018, there were 100 school age pedestrian fatalities. Uh, most of them were uh, children getting on and off school buses. 68 of them were killed by vehicles that were going straight. In other words, that were going straight past the school bus or coming towards the school bus while its stop arm was ex extended. Uh, the other 32 were uh, while the vehicles were turning, going around a corner and not noticing a child had gone out into a crosswalk, uh, for example, after being let off at a corner by a school bus. Uh, but two thirds of them were school buses, go, or, or not school buses, but vehicles going straight past a school bus. So are there any questions about the school safety issues? Again, if you are talking to a legislator in person, you may want to mention these uh, first because they are easy yeses. Uh, All right, not seeing any uh, questions popping up in the chat. Um, we'll move on to our juvenile justice issues that we are focused on. Uh, House Bill 111 will raise the age of uh, for misdemeanors for juvenile courts from 18 to 19. This is supported by a resolution uh, and study report that we did a few years back on raising the age, showing that uh, brain development doesn't really complete until 25. Um, and there are a bunch of benefits that we will talk about here in a minute. This has already passed the House this year, um, which is further than it got last year or, or last session. Uh, it got to third reading, I think, last session. In, one, in the House, but this year it has passed the House, so we are just focused on the Senate and getting them to take it up. Uh, what it is does, or excuse me, and then our second bill is on eliminating use solitary confinement. This is another one that has passed the House. It limits the use of solitary confinement, which is already limited by court order in Illinois, but this is uh, laying out some groundwork on how they can do it. It is allowed only now, if this bill passes, uh, when they are transferring a juvenile from one facility to another, and that's limited to three days in that case. Uh, if they are in court, or you know, potentially over several days uh, in a row and have to leave the facility they are in to attend court, they can be held in, in a cell by themselves for up to seven days. Or if they are getting medical treatment at a facility, um, they can be held uh, in solid by themselves for up to seven days. Beyond that, it limits the use of solitary confinement to only when the juvenile presents a serious and immediate risk of physical harm to themselves or to others. And in no cases in that case is it allowed to be used for more than 24 hours. Uh, in, in the bill, it actually limits uh, if they get themselves back under control and no longer present a threat, they are out in 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, they can't be held any longer than that if they are under control. If they still present a threat to themselves but not to others, they can be out within about three hours. Um, and if it goes more than 24 hours and they are still presenting a threat, then they are to be transferred to another facility where they can be better handled um, because their, their threat of physical harm may be because somebody wants to hurt them and they want to hurt them back. Or there may be a fight uh, or a dispute between them and another uh, juvenile. So that separating them in a different facility may be the best solution. So it really limits solitary confinement use and spells it out. Our ask um, for senators, because both of these bills have passed the House, is to co-sponsor them, of course, move them out and bring them to Florida vote. So with uh, raising the age for misdemeanors, uh, House Bill 111, our talking points. Illinois has already raised the juvenile justice age 
uh, for the juvenile courts from 16 to 17 and then 17 to 18 for both misdemeanors and for felonies, and they've seen a lot of success with it. Uh, part of this is that the juvenile justice system would allow those under 19 avoid an adult arrest record. Uh, and in many cases, especially for misdemeanors, these may not even go to court. They are often adjudicated without a court date. Um, they become just a citation. Uh, but having that adult arrest on your record can cause uh, a young person to have problem with housing, can have problems with uh, getting a education past high school, uh, and getting a job. And when you struggle with, with housing and with education and, and bettering yourself and getting a job, the options very often drive you into committing more crimes. So having them avoid that arrest record and avoid issues with housing, education, and employment can help avoid further crime down the road as well. The juvenile justice system also has more diversion options and more program options uh, that can better tailor the needs of a child or, or young adult um, as well. And as noted in our study that we did a few years back, most people age out of committing crimes by the time they hit their mid 20s. If you are not in the adult prison system by the time you hit 25, you generally don't end up there at all. Um, so if we can keep that adult ad arrest off their record um, until they hit their, you know, a little bit longer and keep them out of the adult prison population, they usually don't offend at all. And the diversion and treatment of programs are very effective for in the juvenile system at avoiding repeat offenses. With solitary confinement, uh, solitary confinement, even with adults, can cause serious psychological, physical, and developmental harm, uh, including persistent mental health problems and suicide. And for children, those risks are even magnified even more. And especially for children with di uh, disabilities or who have had a history of trauma and abuse. And for many children who are in the justice system, they are there in part because they have been subjected to trauma and abuse as a child. Uh, so those risks um, from solitary confinement are, are ramped up for them. More than half of the child suicides and detention occur when they are in solitary confinement or isolation as it is now called sometimes. Um, and more than 60% of the child suicides in detention have had a history of being held in solitary confinement or isolation prior to that. Uh, so the, the effects of solitary confinement aren't limited to just when they are in isolation. It can linger afterwards because they, they are very often uh, children who have suffered trauma and abuse and the solitary confinement makes it worse. Uh, one of the most common uh, things that isolation uh, does is denies out of cell physical exercise. Uh, where they are in their cell 23 hours a day and are given one hour of exercise. And very often it is just in an outside fenced enclosure that is no bigger than their cell is. Um, but we know that physical activity is critical for children's health and growth, as well as helping them just burn off energy. Uh, we've all had those long winter days where our kids who are well-behaved and not you know, subject to, haven't been traumatized, get a little stir crazy if they can't get out and run around a bit. Uh, so that physical exercise that they are deprived of most often in isolation can have serious problems for them. So are there any questions on the juvenile justice issues? Hearing none, we'll wrap up here uh, with a quick little bit about uh, the fall advocacy campaign and how it's going to work. Uh, we will issue a call to action. Uh, if you want to make sure you are signed up for them, when you go to Voter Voice, uh, that take action button on the side of the advocacy page, you know, we've talked about the find officials down at the bottom up at the top, there is sign up for alerts. You just put in your email and your zip code. It may ask for your address as well because it is pairing up your legislators with you. Um, when it does that, uh, and you will get on the mailing list. You may already be on it if you are a PTA president or officer. Uh, we do bring those in there 
uh, as well, but you can also just be sure by putting it in here yourself. When you get a call to action, you'll get an email um, and it will have a link. And in that link, it will take you to voter voice um, and you will find a pre-written letter for you to your legislators. Uh, and it will be targeted so that the uh, bills that have already passed the house, uh, if it's on that issue, uh, the letter will only go to a, your senator, not to your representative. Um, it is a letter you can edit. You can add your own personal story. If you have a child in your school district who was injured because of a school bus stop arm violation and you're talking about Senate Bill 1808, um, you can add that story in as well uh, to your letter before you click send. Uh, when you do si click uh, send, it'll ask you to enter your contact information. Uh, this makes sure that your email goes to your legislator. That's why they put the address and the email in there. Uh, second, your legislator wants to be able to ensure that they can reply back to you. It may be an email that you get back. It may be a letter that they send in the mail to your, your home. So that's also why they want to know your home address. It also lets your legislator know that you are a constituent. You are one of their voters. Um, and they tend to pay a lot more attention to you than if you are not in their district. And finally, how our fall advocacy campaign is going to work is there will be one call to action. We've got five separate bills here, basically, that we are working on uh, with the two gun storage ones kind of combined. Uh, and we don't want to spam your inbox with five separate emails because we send to a large list. And when you do that in a very short amount of time, you start to look like a spammer and Gmail and things tend to move those into spam. So what you will get is one email and it will have a one call to action email and there will be links to all the five campaigns that we will be running on the various bills and say, click on the one that you are most interested in starting with. Uh, and when you go through the process with Voter Voice and you click send at the end, uh, it will pop up a little thank you page at the end saying thank you for this. Uh, what it will also have there, we will make sure is there is, here are the other campaigns, the other bills that we are advocating on for our fall advocacy campaign. Click one of these to go and respond to your legislator on one of these as well. Uh, and when you go through the first one, you find out it only, if you're not adding a personal story, it only takes you about a minute, maybe two, if you have to type in your address a lot and you're a slow typer. Uh, but it can only take a minute or two to get and contact your legislator. So clicking on those other ones, you'll maybe spend 10 minutes. You'll advocate on six different bills on three critical or four critical topics. Uh, and so it's very easy to do. And I think you'll find wow, this was a lot simpler, and why have I not contacted a legislator this way before when I've seen a call to action? And we hope you'll do it lots and lots of times because we know in the spring we will be talking about evidence-based funding, among other things, uh, with the uh, spring session with the new legislators. Uh, so you know, we hope you will take advantage of this when it comes. So that call to action will come out at the start of the veto session. So our fall advocacy campaign will start November 15th, which is the first day of the fall veto session. And as we said, it runs Tuesday through Thursday that week. So the 15th, 16th, and 17th. And then it skips a week for Thanksgiving. And then it picks up again. They'll be back for one more week, uh, the Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday of November 29th and 30th and December 1st. And then they are gone. Um, and they may be a lame duck session at the very start of the year before they swear in the new uh, legislators around January 3rd or 4th. Um, but that's not a guarantee that it will happen necessarily. Uh, so we really want to get these done during the fall veto session here. And if you want to contact me, uh, my email is up there. It is Brian Minsker, bminsker at illinoispta.org. As I said, we will be emailing out a copy of these slides to you tomorrow, and the YouTube video will be up uh, as well, so you can share it with your PTA members who couldn't uh, do this. Encourage them to participate and share. You know, When you get that call to action, feel free to forward it on as well and say, this is important. This can make a difference. Uh, if you're thinking about you know, 
does this really make a difference? Uh, a few years ago, we had an advocacy campaign uh, that focused in part on testing lead drinking water sources in uh, every school in Illinois, every unique drinking water source for lead. Uh, it was a bill that was like the safe gun storage one sitting in rules or in assignments in the Senate and not going anywhere. Uh, but we started talking about it and we started our advocacy campaign. And at the end of the first day, we had picked up a few sponsors. And a few days after that, we had picked up about a dozen co-sponsors. And the bill passed one house in the fall veto session uh, and had picked up a bunch of uh, sponsors in, I think it passed the Senate first and was then in the House. Uh, and it was during the rounder years when there was no budget. And so they did come back after the election uh, for a lame duck session at the beginning of January. We upped our uh, advocacy campaign again with another virtual call and got it through the house as well and signed into law. It was cut back to just K through five, but that means that every public private parochial school in Illinois, kindergarten through fifth grade was testing for lead. Uh, and the action level where they had to notify parents was five parts per million, which is one third of the EPA action level when you have, that says you have to do something. And within six months of that, we saw newspaper articles from across the state of school districts who had tested lead, found lead in the drinking water, were blocking off those, were mitigating those fountains, were changing the pipes out, and, and in many cases, these were pipes that were had lead pipes that were poisoning children for decades. And advocacy from Illinois PTA, we were the only folks talking about this, made a difference for every child who is going into elementary school in Illinois for the last five years has been able to drink water that they know will not have lead in it. So that if you're thinking that, I don't know, does this email really make a difference? It absolutely does. And you can make a huge difference with school bus safety, with juvenile justice, even if it's not your kid who's gonna be in the juvenile justice system. You know, those kids, we want them to be successful adults too, because they may end up being the plumber you call at three in the morning when your pipes freeze and break. Uh, so it's important that we speak out as we say in our PTM motto, every child, one voice, have your voice, join our one voice, advocate, Respond to those call to actions. Thank you for joining us tonight. And if you have any final questions, I'll pause here for a minute before we stop the recording. Seeing none, thank you again for joining us. And 